So um, this tutorial is all about forming and injection molding. First two questions we're going to go through are on uh, forming. And I'll go through each question bit by bit. Um, if you don't, if anything doesn't make sense, please feel free to ask questions. Um, so the first question is sketch the typical features of a punch load versus punch displacement curve for a cold forward extrusion process. Um, and we need to label the sketch and account for its various features. So cold extrusion is specifically the forward variant is a type of forming where we use a force to redistribute raw material. Um, other examples of forming include things like rolling and deep drawing, which there's a question on later. But in a nutshell, we're just applying a force and pushing material around with some sort of plastic flow usually involved. Um, extrusion is where we force material through a die to form a rod or a bar um, with a chosen cross-sectional shape. As the word cold suggests, this doesn't involve any heating, um, as you'll remember from your lecture. There are two specific uh, geometries with cold extrusion. Um, we've got the forward, so the top version, where the ram and the material travel in the same direction, and the reverse or indirect version, where the ram is traveling in the opposite direction to the extruded material. So this is a typical, and it will obviously vary depending on the exact material or geometry and process that we're using, but a typical cold extrusion um, punch load versus displacement curve will look like this. And there are several aspects to this, which are important, several features. So first of all, as we bring the ram in, it first makes contact with the billet material. We have section A. We have a rapid rise in the punch load as both the ram and the material begin to elastically deform. Um, so this is a, there's, there's, there's a very short amount, a very small amount of displacement, but the load increases quite significantly. Um, as it reaches the elastic limit um, the billet of the billet, we begin to see some plastic deformation. Um, so this is part B. Um, and at this point, the, even though the housing should be um, a very similar, similar uh, geometry and volume to the billet, there will still be space around it um, so that it can move around. So at this point, the billet begins to expand and fill the space as the die, as the punch moves inwards. At point C, we get a small decrease as the sticking friction, which is dominating in um, parts A and B, the initial points of the, uh, the ram moving, um, transfers to sliding friction, i.e. the billet begins to move at the point it begins to move, we get a very small, uh, slight decrease in the punch load um, as the ram begins to move forward. And then uh, our next feature, part D, we have a proportional decrease in load as the punch moves or the ram moves forward and the die travels, uh, sorry, and the billet travels towards the die. So at this point, we're extruding the material. And as the amount of material in the casing reduces the amount of friction, um, the amount of contacts between the billet and the, uh, and the die casing reduces. So we have a very, we have a slight and proportional decrease in the load, depending on how far inwards it is. Um, at part E, RAM is getting close to the die. So the amount of material is, is getting much lower at this point. And, um, and it enters the region, region where the plas where plastic flow is dominating around the, with the material. So this is where this is the part of the material 
um, that is flowing through the die. Um, at this point, the load decreases more quickly um, due to the plastic flow and the sliding friction um, is, is almost completely gone. Um, sliding friction of the main billet um, against the housing. At point F, when there is a very, very small amount of material left, um, we have a, we have a radial, um, sorry, I haven't moved this on actually. We have radial forces, which um, radial friction, which dominates. So at the point where the punch is almost in contact with the die, and we have a very small amount of material left, we get uh, domination of radial friction. And at this point, the punch load increases very rapidly. Um, and it's also therefore at the point where we want to stop uh, the process um, in case we break the tooling. Um, so the three main, three main sections of these features are what we call the coining or the elastic phase which is parts A and B. We've got the steady state phase, which as the name suggests, we have a proportional decrease in load and the non-steady state phase, which is where things get a bit more complicated towards the end. Um, any questions so far on that? So, so can you explain part E again, please? Part E, yeah. So <clears throat> when the die, sorry, when the RAM is moving, um, is moving the billet in, we have two, can you see my mouse by the way? Yeah. Okay, so we have two distinct sections. We have part of the billet, which is just sliding. Um, so it's not deforming any other way. It's, it's just sliding in due to the ram. And then close to the die, where it can no longer slide, it's beginning to, uh, it's flowing plastically. So there's a region just beyond the die where plastic flow is dominating. And at that point, when the RAM gets to the point uh, where the billet becomes small enough that all of that material is in the plastic flow region, we have a, slow, we have a slight decrease in load because the flow itself is, um, um, it's essentially it's easier to push it while it's flowing and we don't have that extra friction from the sliding of the billet. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any Asha, other questions? Sorry. Uh, could you please explain why the punch loading uh, increases that much at point F? Why it increases? So yeah. um, this is at the point where there is now, um, there is very little plastic flow. So we have such a small amount of material. The ram is right next to the die. And we're essentially trying to squeeze all of that material against a, a relatively low angled um, portion of the die. So when the run, when the ram is very close to the die, um, and there's hardly any material, there's just a thin uh, sliver of material between the ram and the die. We are our angle, um, our angle of contact is much much sharper. So that that material is no longer being pushed by the material behind it. So when we're in the plastic flow region, we have material in front of the ram, which is forcing uh, the material next to the die around the die and through to the extrusion part. Um, but at this point, when the ram is right next to it and there's no material behind it, we are just trying to push that very thin layer of material uh, through the die. Um, and so at this point we have, um, so this is obviously a cross section. Um, we have radial forces. So going inwards in towards the center in this diagram, which are dominating. Um, and as it gets closer, we have a very rapid rise in force as a result of that. Does that help? Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I'll keep going then. So part two of question one is uh, calculation. So we're asked to calculate the force and energy required to completely extrude a, bit, a metal billet, the diameter, the length, um, and the compressive yield stress of the material are given. We're also told that the extrusion forces, the same material with a different initial billet diameter have been measured. 
for two separate die diameters of six and 18 millimeters. So um, first up, we're talking about 180 degree circular die. So Johnson's equation um, is relevant here um, as that is, that's the assumed, that's the assumed die angle. Um, so we can go ahead and use Johnson's empirical formula, which is down here. Um, so we've got the extrusion pressure divided by the compressive yield stress, and that's equal to two constants, A plus B, which we, um, we can either get from, uh, which we can get from empirical analysis. So measuring them directly, uh, measuring and calculating them indirectly. Um, and then we've got this value R, which is the reduction of the, uh, of the diameter or the length, um, which, and those two are related. Um, so we're asked to, um, we're asked to uh, find the, um, the force and the energy. And the energy, of course, is found by multiplying our force uh, once we've calculated it by the distance over which it's applied. So the work done, essentially. Um, so first up, we need to um, we need to identify which which values we've got and which we don't. We are given the initial and the final area, so the extruded area of the um, well, we're given the initial and extruded diameters of the material. We can convert those into areas, um, and we're asked to calculate the force. Um, and Johnson's equation gives us the pressure. So pressure is equal to the force divided by um, cross-sectional area. So we can calculate the force using that. So we've got we've got Johnson's equation. We've got the yield stress. We can calculate the um, the pressure using the force. So that's the capital P here, confusingly, divided by the cross-sectional area. Um, and we've got the area because we're given the uh, diameter, the initial and the final diameters. So first thing that we can do is we can replace R with our uh, reduction relation. So we have the initial area and the extruded area, i.e. the change in area as a fraction of the initial area. That gives us the reduction of the area. Uh, we can rearrange that so that we have uh, one minus a fraction of the extruded area over the initial area. Um, and we can do a bit more rearranging uh, once we plug those in. So I won't take you literally step by step. Um, but if we sub in one minus AE over A naught into R in this equation here and simplify it, we actually find that one over one minus R is equal to uh, the inverse of this fraction here. So we've got our initial area as a fraction of the extruded area. Um, so that simplifies things somewhat. Um, of course, to calculate the area, we just use um, our pi r squared um, or pi d squared over four. Um, we can keep things in millimeters. Um, and as long as we keep that consistent throughout the calculation, that's okay. Um, and it's also okay for our fraction of areas here because the units will cancel. Um, so much easier if we do this with a table using a, a table of values. So we're given our um, we're given two sets of test results, um, and you'll see why this is important in a second. Um, we've got a different uh, initial diameter to the the main question, and we've got the same uh, 180 degree diameter. Um, sorry, angle die, and we've got two um, extruded areas. So we've got two die diameters of six and 18 millimeters over here. Convert those into areas using this equation up here. Um, 
Of course, the area, initial area is the same for both of them. It's just the die that's changing. So therefore we get two different um, initial versus uh, extruded area fractions. We can then fill in our, this part of the equation as we know that this part in the brackets is AE over A naught. Um, plug that into your calculator, natural log, and we get these two values. And then we can calculate our force, sorry, our pressure using the forces that we've measured. So we're told that the measured extrusion forces are 48 and 17 kilonewtons uh, respectively. Um, so we plug those into this equation here. We're using the initial area that's important for the um, for the pressure calculation because the die, um, sorry, the ram is applying all the force on that on that face on the initial area face. So we divide our um, we divide our forces, and we need to make sure this is in newtons at this point. Um, we can keep in millimeters as long as we then um, quote our answer in newtons per millimeter squared. We need to convert this into newtons, so 48,000, for instance, divided by our initial area, which is 491, and we get these two values. Um, final thing we can calculate then is the first part of our Johnson's equation. So we can just um, normalize this with the yield stress, which we're given. And we're using the same material throughout this question. So it's always 18 newtons per millimeter squared. So if we divide our pressures with the yield stress, we get these two values here. So we plug those numbers in to our Johnson's equations who replace the pressure over yield strength, yield stress, and our one over one minus R with these values here. Then we get two simultaneous equations. So this is this is why it's important that we have two tests with different diameters. We have two unknowns, A and B, and they should be the same. They're constant for each um, for the same material, and they differ across materials. So when we plug our numbers in, we get two simultaneous equations like this. Um, and if we subtract the second one from the first one, we can also solve it using direct substitution if you fancy. Um, but this is just a bit of algebra here. We just subtract the first one, the second one from the first one. The A's will cancel out. We'll get 3.5 on the left equals 2.2 B on the right. Um, and therefore, if we divide both sides um, by 2.2, we get B equals 1.6. We found B now, so we can sub that straight into either of these equations and um, retrieve A. So we've got our two constants here. So we've just used this bit in the blue box, this information, where we've measured the extrusion forces for two different die diameters. Um, once we've calculated our constants, we can sub those back into the original uh, Johnson's equation. So we can replace A and B here. And we, of course, from earlier found that one over one minus R is the initial area over the extruded area, both of which we know from the original and main question. So we've got 24 millimeters and 13 millimeters this time. And of course, we know the yield stress. So we only have one unknown now in this, in this equation. Um, so first up, we can calculate our initial area from our initial diameter um, and our extruded area from our extruded diameter, 13. So we get these two areas, find the fraction of those, which, which is 3.408, the natural log of that, which is 1.226 or thereabouts. Um, no, it's always good to do these um, on your calculator and save the previous answer, because even though doing it to two or three decimal places is usually fine, because you're combining so many of those values, you might end up, um, you might end up with a final answer, which is out by, which is out at the third decimal place, for instance. Um, anyway, we plug our, uh, so we have our, our pressure over the yield stress, and that's equal to 2.837, and therefore 
we times that by the um, times that by the area, and we get um, sorry times that um, yeah times that by the yield stress on the right hand side, and we get our pressure is zero point zero five one kilonewtons per millimeter squared. Um, you can always give that in newtons per millimeter squared if you want. Um, and finally, to find our force, so our extrusion force, we just times that by the area. Um, and that will give us 23 kilonewtons. Final part of the question is to calculate the energy. And once we have the force, we can convert that into energy just by knowing how long the um, extrusion is and therefore how much distance the punch has traveled. So work done is equal to force times distance um, in meters. So 0 0.06 times 23.05, um, our force from earlier, and that will give us uh, 1.383 kilojoules. Um, understand there's lo loads of numbers involved here, and it's quite hard to follow um, when all I'm doing is talking. Um, it's usually easier if it's on like a whiteboard or something. So um, if you haven't followed all of this to the letter, then don't worry. Um, this is being recorded, so you can go through and do your own working, work it through um, yourself. Um, it's also not the only way to do it. Um, so the equation is always going to be the same as all the values, but you can rearrange this differently. Um, so are there any questions on that? death by calculation. Okay. Um, hi, I've got a question if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know the constants A and B, what do yeah. they represent? Oh, like, what do they actually mean? They are literally, um, they're just calibration constants. So, um, it's, it's not a theoretical uh, formula. There are assumptions made when we do it. For instance, we have 180 degree um, angle of die, but these constants were measured by Johnson um, using several different materials. Uh, have I got the graph here? No. Um, and they are they they literally just represent um, they just represent uh, relations to things like the gradient and the um, and the intercept. So A is technically the intercept. Let me just double check this before I tell you the wrong thing. And B um, is the gradient. Olivia, you can probably jump in if you know the answer. Um, From my understanding, they were, um, the original equation um, was adjusted by Johnson um, because as we'll find out later, it's not perfectly accurate. Um, and so through many, many repeated um, experiments, he concluded that there needed to be constants A and B. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good explanation. Um, I'm just trying to find the, um, the, the lecture. I think it was 16. Probably wouldn't have been a good idea to include it um, on the slides. Yeah, okay, got it. Um, I'll just quickly share this. Okay, so this is Johnson's experiment. Um, so yeah, uh, as Olivia said, it's, it's essentially a correction to the theory. Um, in a mathematical sense though, B is essentially the gradient and A is the intercept, um, i.e. the point where the graph meets, the point where the, um, the best fit line meets the uh, y-axis. Yeah, um, Okay. Thank you. Right, back to, back to our presentation. Um, are there any more questions, by the way, on that? Before we carry on. No? Okay, so following on from that question, um, we've basically answered this. 
indicate why your answer is to part two. So why that calculation is approximate. So even though Johnson has corrected that, um, the theory using those constants, it, there are still approximations made. First, first of all, of course, being the angle of the die, um, but that's fine in this case, because we are using that angle. Um, but the main thing is that we're assuming um, that everything is, is constant, like the force, um, and also that there are no defects produced. So there's no cavitation at the front between the, um, the ram and the material, and also at the die. Um, and also we're assuming that there's a constant, uh, there's a constant deformation field uh, where, where we have plastic flow. So there are, in, there, whilst it is a decent, as, as a decent approximation um, and works for, uh, works for most real cases, in reality, everything, it, everything's a bit more complicated. Um, especially when we talk about complex geometries or materials that say are not um, homogenous. Okay, so question two, assuming that there aren't any more questions on that. Um, so question two is about deep drawing. So we're still on forming here. Um, we're still on cold forming, but this time we are creating cups or bowls or or pots um, and deep drawing is a process essentially where we stretch um, we stretch material using a die and a punch so um, generally well we're always talking about some sort of sheet material which we place over a die and a punch then comes in and pushes that material into the die cavity um, we need also some sort of holder that keeps the flange, which is basically the rim around the um, around the blank that hasn't been pushed down into the die yet. Um, as we'll see in a second, that stops um, it from wrinkling and buckling. Um, we need some sort of lubrication so that this material can slide inwards and downwards, but not too much lubrication. Um, again, as we'll quickly look at. Um, and of course, our punch and die denote the shape of the final uh, the final part. So the following phenomena, wrinkling and earring, relate to this process of deep drawing. And we're asked to describe those phenomena um, with the aid of sketches. Um, so I'll go through the first one, which is wrinkling. I mentioned briefly. So in this part here, the flange, the edge bit, if we have uh, too much lubrication, so there's too much free movement and or there's not enough pressure. So these red arrows here on the side, on the blue part, which is the blank hole, there's not enough force pushing this part down, it will buckle. Um, and that's simply because we are forcing material radially inwards into a smaller region. Um, so it has to go somewhere. Um, if there is enough force, on the blank holder, that material plastically flows inwards. So it essentially, um, it's analogous to it merging into um, into the edge corner where it's where it's then pulled down and stretched out. Um, so we get this wavy pattern, um, which we call wrinkling, um, and it's avoided as as I as I've alluded to by. Uh, compromising between the amount of lubrication and the force of the um, of the blank holder. As we'll see from the next bit, it's not as simple as that. We can't just use um, an infinitely large force on the blank holder and we can't just um, get rid of the lubrication. Um, so just to check at this point, um, I think we're doing all right for time. Um, check who's still with us. Um, if you could, I'm just going to share it a little bit. Um, this bit. Bear with me. Okay, can everyone see the 
the new shared screen if you can um either on your phone or whatever you're viewing this on go to www.menti.com and type in the code above which is 9315 um and you'll be able to submit an answer um not quite sure what happens when we run out of space but they should just pop up in this blank bit here so the question is in deep drawing of sheet material how do ears form so how do we get this wavy pattern uh, which we call ears or lobes and anyone remember from the lectures i'll give it about five minutes um have a guess uh yeah an educated guess if you can um if you can't remember Um, but think about the, uh, the original sheet material and how that is processed usually. Anisotropy. Excellent. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. Some people have definitely been paying attention. So when we uh, when we create a rolled sheet, sorry, when we create a sheet of, uh, of metal, we generally roll it uh, and keep rolling it uniaxially uh, until it's thin enough. And that act of rolling it uniaxially creates uh, a preferential grain direction or texture in the in the final material. So that preferential alignment of grains um, will um will then deform anisotropically when we uh when we deform it with a symmetrical radial uh punch so if we imagine um if we imagine punching through a load of fibers they're going to uh they're going to create a different they're going to create a, an anisotropic pattern when we punch through them with a radial die the difference here is that we're actually getting a variation in the um stress strain response so we get less we get more or less um strain or deformation depending on which direction the load is compared to the grain direction or the grain axis uh, and as it turns out if your force is either perpendicular or aligned with the grain then there is uh more deformation and if it's less uh, if it's off axis um and proportionally so we get um we get less deformation so essentially a higher tensile uh, strength um hope that makes sense i'm just going to go back to the powerpoint um so it's called earring and we can prevent it by either cutting off the ears at the end or by uh, heat treating our sheet material before we put it in to the um, before it, uh, put it into the deep draw components. Um, are there any questions on that on either wrinkling or earring? Okay, I'll carry on then. So part two is another calculation. Happy days. Um, an engineering company has a requirement to manufacture a quantity of cylindrical cups um, using deep drawing. They need to be 40 millimeters in diameter, and we have a sheet. Uh, we have sheet discs of 200 millimeters to deep draw them from. Um, the deep in, of the deep drawing is simply because we generally um, is generally a much higher. Uh, there's much higher draw than um, uh, yeah it's, it's an anisotropic final draw um, diameter um, we're told the draw ability or the limiting draw ratio so the draw ratio is the um, is the ratios of the diameters so the initial diameter of the sheet disc uh, divided by the final diameter um, and this essentially tells us how um, what sort of 
what, yeah, the, it tells us the maximum difference between those two values before tearing, um, which is when we essentially um, essentially break the component, break the material um, by tearing it, um, is likely to happen. Um, we're also told the reduction in diameter is limited to 62% between anneals. So if you can recall from the lecture, uh, not only do we have a drawability, but we also need to occasionally uh, and peri periodically reset the microstructure um, to stop it from um, suffering from work hardening induced fracture. So as we are stretching the material, um, we're applying huge amounts of stress, there will be residual stress left after each draw. Um, we're also hardening the material by applying that, stra that strain to it. Um, so the tooling designer has specified a two-stage drawing operation. Um, however, the production engineer disagrees and believes that more stages are needed. We need to perform appropriate calculations, see who's right, um, and work out how many stages we need, how many draw stages and how many annealing stages between, um, and also state our assumptions as ever. So, as you may recall, um, there are many industrial processes where multiple deep draw stages are needed. We can't simply go from a flat disc to our tall and narrow sprite can in this case. Um, we have to do it in stages where we're ever decreasing the billet diameter, sorry, the die diameter. Um, so the purpose of this is to prevent uh, brittle fracture due to work hardening um, and also um, yeah to stop it from to stop it from tearing that is the essential essential uh, conclusion there so this is our this is our first our first stop is our draw ratio so we have our blank or initial disc diameter divided by our punch diameter we have our overall draw ratio which will be this disc versus our final product and we have a draw ratio for each of these processes. So each of these stages will have a draw ratio, um, depending on, yeah, where we simply compare uh, the previous diameter to the current diameter. Um, and our limiting draw ratio is given as 1.6. So in this case, um, we need to do it in multiple stages so that we don't exceed that for any of the stages. The overall draw ratio um, is D0 over Dn, where N is the number of operations or stages, and D0 is our initial diameter, so our blank diameter. Um, that can be expressed as a product of all the individual draw ratios. Um, so from stage, stage one, stage two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's, as you've been told, it's good practice to have equal draw ratios for each process, not just from a materials point of view, but also mathematically it makes things much easier. Um, so if we assume that each draw ratio is the same for each stage, then we can simplify this relation up here to D0 over D1, um, where D0 is our initial diameter, D1 is our final uh, or our next diameter. Um, and n is the number of uh, stages. So with this equation and the information we've given, we can, we can calculate what n is. So n is the number of stages, the number of draws, essentially. Um, we're told that the initial blank diameter is 200 millimeters, the final is 40 millimeters. So the overall draw ratio is here, is five. As you can see, that is considerably larger than 1.6. So we can't do this in one stage. We can't just draw it all straight into one, um, one 40 millimeter cup. Instead, we need to split it into multiple stages. And our second assumption is that we use the limiting draw ratio. So we're gonna we're trying to get this done in as few uh, stages as possible. So we assume that the draw ratio is 1.6 i.e. the maximum that it can be. Um, in practice, probably not a great idea because if we have a draw ratio of 1.6 and the limit is 1.6, we still are risking 
um, uh, fracture. But if we assume it's 1.6, we have 5 equals 1.6 to the power of n. So if we take the log of both sides, we can solve this equation, this relation for n. And we find that um, when we rearrange that, we have n equals 3.42. So that is the number of stages required to keep the draw ratio below the limiting or at or below the limiting. Uh, in this case, at the limiting draw ratio. Um, in reality, we can't have um, anything other than an integer number of stages. So we need to round this up. As we need more than three, we need four. Um, so we're going to do this in four drawing operations. Um, at this point, before I burn through, are there any more questions? This makes sense so far. Okay. So next step is we need to consider the annealing steps. So we know we can do this um, in four drawing operations, four stages. If we now use this relation again, but we know what n is and we know what our draw ratio is, um, our overall draw ratio is, we can solve for our individual one. Of course, we've rounded up from 3.42 or, yeah, 3.42 to four. Um, so in our actual case, if we want to uh, calculate the number of annealing steps, we can sub that back in, but using our new number of four for our new n. Um, the reduction equation is given by this. So this is similar to um, as we had with the extrusion, where we have the fraction of the, um, the final diameter to the original diameter. One minus that will give us our um, will give us our decimal of our reduction, so 62%, 0.62. As you might have noticed, this fraction here is the inverse of our draw ratio up here. So we can sub that straight in um, and therefore use values that we know. Um, so we simply are rearranging this equation here to find this relation and subbing in for dn over d0 from up here. And we're replacing n, small n here, with our new n, which is the number of annealing steps. So if we just quickly wind back here, we can find out what d0 over d1 is, our draw ratio, um, our working draw ratio, so our actual one that we're using, um, by subbing in the actual number that we're our drawing operations we're using. And we know that the overall drawing ratio is 5. So we can solve this little relation here. Um, by simply taking uh, the fourth root of five, and that will give us D0 over D1, our working draw ratio, which is 1.495 or thereabouts. That might actually even be exact. I can't quite remember. Um, we can then sub this back in. So D0 over D1 is now 1.495. Again, take the natural log of both sides, and we can then rearrange and solve for N. Okay, so we plus this over to the other side, divide both sides by, um, by log 1 minus 0 0.62. That will give us n is 2.406. So that is the number of annealing steps required for a 62% reduction uh, between steps. Okay, so if we need, if, if we can only have 2.406 uh, drawing operations before we need an annealing step, we need to reduce, we need to round this down. Um, if we round it up, then we are, we're cons well, then we're talking about having more drawing operations before our annealing step. Um, so we need to do it every two steps. So in conclusion, we have four drawing operations as we calculated originally, and one uh, annealing step every two drawing operations. Okay, so that means that we'll have two draw uh, stages, one anneal step, and then two more draw um, operations. So a total of five stages. So the production engineer is correct. Going all the way back to the original question, more than two stages are required. Um, okay, so don't worry if you've got lost somewhere along the way, but um, are there any questions there? Do you remember this is being recorded so you can go through it? at your own pace later. Hi, sir. Yeah.
Sure. Could you please explain again what uh, n means? So our original n is simply the number. So up here, the small n is simply the number of drawing operations that we have. So if we assume that d o d zero over d one is equal to this one, so each of these fractions are the same, we replace the subscripts and just assume that as they're all the same, the fractions are all the same. We just call them all d zero over d one, and rather than times them all together, that is the same as saying that to the power of n, so n numbers. So if we have three drawing operations, n will be three, i.e. we're having this one times this one times one more. Um, so that's just a simplification and then using this assumption that we have equal draw ratios. All we're doing in this point when we replace small n with capital N is just calling it something different. We could call that x or y or um or even number of operations we're just replacing it and saying okay we know that we had before we calculated we had n equals 3.42 but we've rounded that up to four so we've now replaced little n with four so if we go back and plug that in to this equation here that will allow us to calculate the actual draw ratio which is what we call the working draw ratio uh 1.495 does that, does that help somewhat? Yeah, and how do we get the final number for drawing operations? As in down here, this number here. Okay, so we have, we've worked out that we need four drawing operations or, um, uh, or stages in order to turn a 200 millimeter diameter disc into a 40 millimeter diameter cup without exceeding our drawability of 1.6 for each of the individual draw ratios so we've we know we need four drawing operations but we also need every we've also calculated here that we need every two steps to prevent fracture we need to add in an annealing step so we still need four drawing steps but every two steps we need an annealing step so it's depending on where you start, you're always going to need at least five steps. You're always going to need to start with, let's assume we start with our, with our disc and we do two drawing operations. We then need to do an annealing step because n equals two. And we have then two more to finish to get it to our 40 millimeters. We would then do another annealing step if, you, if we wanted to go even further, but we're stopping at 40 millimeters. Does that, does that help? Yeah, thank you very much. Cool. Any other questions? We are, I've realized now, running a little behind time. We've only got a short question to finish up on. Um, feel free to ask any questions. I'll also stick around at the end just in case. So we have uh, burned through this. Um, okay, so on to the final question. This time we're talking about injection molding. So a thermal process using polymers. Um, and depending on how much you remember from the lectures, uh, this may or may not be totally familiar. Um, so based on the following graphic, identify and describe the four main stages of the injection cycle. So this is a typical injection molding cycle where we have the cavity pressure. So the pressure within the chamber of the injection mold machine versus the time, so the cycle time in this case. So this whole curve represents one cycle from putting the raw material in to getting a molded part. Um, and finally, we need to explain what the holding pressure is, and why that is applied. So injection molding, we're assuming we're talking about this conventional process here, um, where we have a hopper, and that is where we put our raw and uh, solid, usually solid pellets of polymer or plastic, um, thermoplastic, and we put this into the hopper. We have a rotating screw, which will basically push or draw the uh, material through the barrel. So it's uh, surrounded by the heater here. The heater provides thermal energy. Uh, which will melt the plastic and the combined shear forces of the screw pushing this material and the heater providing the thermal energy will melt our material. It is then able to flow into the mold and to 
help it along and make sure it fills the mold completely, we drive the screw in uh, and drive the material. And that's hence the injection part of injection molding. So go through a nozzle into the mold and hopefully it fills all the gaps. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. We've got four main stages to this graph here that aren't actually labeled, although they are, they do relate. But plastification, which is a convoluted way of saying we're melting our plastic. Um, it's essentially forming our plastic fluid, um, which should be vaguely homogenous at that point. So the polymer, as I said, is melted by the heaters and extra energy is provided by sheer force of the screw. So that is this part here, the fill, the initial part where the pressure is starting to increase. Um, so our second stage is the injection stage. Uh, this whole screw moves forward once we've got um, a liquid polymer in the middle um, in the chamber. And that pushes the polymer, the liquid through the nozzle and into the mold. Okay, so at this point, the pressure um, will be increasing rapidly. And at the point where it's where the screw hits the end and stops driving it in, in that way, it starts, our uh, cavity pressure starts to taper off. Still holding the screw there, so there is still pressure applied, which um, is called the holding pressure. Well, the holding pressure is actually the screw rotating whilst it's held there. Um, so at this point, our screw is rotating. We're still applying pressure into the fluid, um, as I'll talk about briefly in a second. That's our second stage. The third stage is our um, cooling and packing. So this is essentially whilst we're still holding the screw in and it's still rotating and the packing part is essentially filling all the gaps and also allowing um, material to um, replace any areas that have been produced by shrinkage. Um, so as soon as the material, the molten material hits the mold, it will be cooled and it will be actively cooled. There'll be cooling chambers within the mold. So as soon as it hits that, it will be shrinking. And that's why we need to apply constant pressure. Um, fourth stage is our demold and injection. So we're holding the pressure here, which we call the pressure phase. It's then cooling down. Um, and at this point, we are basically re slowly releasing uh, the pressure on the screw to the point where we retract the screw and uh, we track the uh, movable part of the mold and then allow the um, part to fall out or we remove the part. And at that point, we can then restart the cycle. So this whole time here, start to finish is one cycle. Um, I basically answered this question already, but the holding pressure is that pressure that's applied when the screw is all the way in um, and it's accounting for um, any shrinkage. So we're still applying pressure, the screw is still turning whilst the, uh, at the initial stage of the cooling. Um, and that will continue happening until this part here, so the nozzle um, and connection area is solidified, at which point there's no longer any point in applying pressure. Okay, that is a whirlwind tour um, of these questions, at least. Has anyone got any questions on this part? So, uh, so injection molding? Yep. The holding pressure, where, where on, the, on the graph is that? Um, so the holding pressure is here. We're applying a constant pressure. And what's causing that little peak before it, before it the, little, the bit that sticks out a little bit? This bit here, this yeah. Knob. So that is half of that peak is the fill stage. Okay, so it's just the fill getting to a maximum, um, and it's at the point where we're driving the screw in. It hits a maximum, and then, as I said before, as soon as it hits the mold, the material will start to shrink, and as it shrinks, that pressure will reduce. Okay. So that's our initial bit of reduction. It's hitting a very cold mold, so. And then the, the second drop is when it, the rest of it is cools down. And exactly. On exactly. It. it will cool down from the edges quite quickly. And then parts in the center, especially if it's a, a thick part, um, will cool down um, 
So this this part here is shouldn't be mistaken for the cooling. Um, this is just the pressure being applied. Um, the cooling itself is a different shape, um, but it still relates to the part where we're basically the whole part is slowly cooling. Um, and it hasn't necessarily, and it hasn't, um, it's essentially at this point, it's solidified. That's why we removed the, well, at least this part just beyond the nozzle. So the connection point has, has solidified. That's why we get this curve here. Um, and then we, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We remove it when it's, when it's cool enough. Um, any other questions? This question hasn't gone over, um, defects and things except for um, talking about shrinkage um, but of course could have a question on that as well the other types of defects we can get um, it's three o'clock so you can go if you wish um, if you've got any questions though you can still ask them um, I'm going to stop recording now so if you were uh,